but there was one guy who was dealing with getting a little bit pissy over the kid interrupting the call thing, and I'm like, Chiri <laughs> Oreo! Appreciate. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> my bad. My bad. Please continue. It's very alliterative. They are going to be the ones powering, powering the experiences that every customer had. Preference has power. I'm pretty sure Kato would say to me when I do every show, stop, 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 stop. I think he would. Those pieces are popping. Wait till you get the invoice. Uh, <laughs> here, here. I have a question. When's the last time you danced? When's the last time you laughed? Right you just, now. <laughs> you flew. <laughs> I don't want to dance with you. Time, when's the last time you flew a kite? Toasted Oreo. <laughs> Look at you. You I are mean, insane. How did I do that? You're how insane. Did I do that? You're insane. <laughs> Well, hello, everybody. Welcome, 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 one and all. I'm sounding a little bit like John Oliver right now. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I need a, a wider screen as well. Another great show. You are right, Mr. Bob Farnham. He said, looks like another great episode. How can it not be? How can it not be? Well, besides my guest, it is National Cocktail Day. It is five o'clock somewhere. It is not five o'clock where Jay Samet is right now. It is not five o'clock where I am right now. And anyway, I'm intermittent fasting, but I will have a cocktail today because how can I not celebrate on National Cocktail Day? Mr. Stephen Rubin is here. He is watching. And Mr. David Libby is here as well. And he is glad to be here. And I am glad to have you as well. Um, yesterday, I gave a little update. I think it was yesterday about how my creator coin, my own little branded uh, cryptocurrency uh, is doing. And while I was actually doing the present, the, the while I was doing the show, I should say, uh, both Glenn and Manif sent me some Jaffe coins. So I appreciate it. Uh, it's really awesome to see us expanding and in and getting behind um, the Jaffe economy. All things Jaffe. Uh, I launched yesterday an idea which uh, shows. You know, Jay is right now in the green room and he's just shaking his head at me because I'm a very bad businessman because I'm telling you. When you send me one Jaffe coin, I will send you two back in return. How do I how do I make money? As the old as the old joke goes, I make it up on volume. Um, so we won't get into the math for that. But I am continuing to think about ways um, that you guys can share in this experience. It isn't just one way. It isn't just me, the host, and you, the passive viewers or listeners. You get to comment on the show. You get to come on the show. There's the Zoom off the show. And they're all different ways that you can participate in the show. I am very, very bullish on entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurial revolution, and more importantly, the creator economy, because that is the times that we are living in. So yesterday, I did uh, the masterclass for the Association of National Advertisers. Uh, Scott and, and Fanzo, Richie, Roxy, and myself, we did the entire masterclass as an episode of this show and then we had an amazing after show in Clubhouse. At one point, we had almost 1,500 people uh, in the room. That just shows you what happens when you're able to uh, collect and congregate and come together using non-traditional uh, platforms and innovative emerging ones at that. With someone that really understands about disruption, about innovation, about the future, and specifically future proofing is my guest today, uh, Jay Samet. Uh, you know, best-selling author is just the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. You'll get a proper introduction soon enough. What a week we're having. Tomorrow, Sean Kanungo will be uh, doing a show with me at 9 o'clock tomorrow night, 9 p.m. for all of you night owls. And, uh, and for Tom Morris, try and stay up a little bit for it, Tom. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. So 9 p.m. on Thursday and then 9 a.m., on Friday, our community show, really just trying to mix it up and see what resonates with you. So Jay Bear, Joe Delagrave, and uh, Jason Falls will be with me on uh, 12 hours later. So we'll see whether breakfast works better or evening or dinner or hell, I'll do it at midnight if that's what it takes. Um, birthdays, Justin Lazarus uh, in the UK, Mary Bermel, um, I met her all the way back when, when she, I think, worked at HP. Uh, Sean Gold, Jerome Jacobson back in South Africa, and Valerie Vesper. Happy birthday to all of you. Hope you're having 
a great day. And then finally, uh, uh, Laurel Papworth, there's JC Granger, uh, Mark Anderson, uh, all of my LinkedIn connections. Have a great day and uh, know that there is always celebration for the day that you were born right here and right now. Well, it's time for our uh, seated soliloquy. And it was funny because in the green room earlier, I was talking uh, to Jay uh, and Jay was saying, well, listen, Joe, you know, you can do many things in your life, but uh, if you're going to differentiate your show uh, on nothing more than a monologue, good luck, good luck, son, <laughs> because uh, you're competing with all of these late night talk show hosts that have staffs, legends, armies, if you will, uh, of riders. Well, that's not what the seated soliloquy is because I'm seated, damn it. They're standing, but I am seated. Does that not differentiate me in of itself? But more importantly, uh, it isn't about comedy. It really is an homage uh, to, as always, uh, my very special guests. But today's theme is all about future-proofing. And off the bat, the question to be asked is whether that is an oxymoron, future-proofing, you know, like an open secret. Like I said in the description of today's show, I was always told, and truth be told, I tell others this as well, that there's no such thing as future-proofing, more like future-protecting. Future-proofing conjures up the word association of foolproof, but an emphasis on the word fool, surely. But something in me just doesn't quite believe that, and I still don't. I want to believe it is possible and with the right mindset, training, and daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly practices, it must be achievable. Now, in Built to Suck, I introduced the concept of embracing your heresy. Are you prepared to put yourself out of business? What if you fired yourself? What if you fired your customer? What if you funded your competition? What if you did a hard reset? This is about as close to the embodiment of the adaptation component of the survival instinct that we all need to, in order to stay alert, vigilant, connected, self-aware, and always, always, always dynamic and in motion. Future proof is not a feature or an add-on that you can just select upon checkout. Having access to the Geek Squad, Genius Bar, or Apple Care is a protection, but it isn't a proof. Consider the difference between waterproof and water resistant. Maybe that's a better way to think about ways to manage volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. There are no guarantees in life. Nothing is predictable. The only constant is change. But here comes the Yoda moment. If you are at peace with the very nature of the chaos, then there is a calmness to it all. And with that calmness, comes the ability to navigate through all of the muck and the mire with a deft and sublime mastery of the madness, a method to the madness, order from chaos. It is possible. It has to be possible. What meditation is to anxiety, surely there are principles, practices, and processes that can help guide us and allow or even empower us to manage the gray. When we expect the unexpected, the unpredictable becomes predictable, doesn't it? One more thing, future-proofing is a team sport. So surround yourself with friendlies, mentors, allies, coaches, friends, and family that are generous in spirit, abundant in knowledge, and selfless in wisdom, just like my guest today. Well, let's get into it and let's welcome him on to the show, Mr. Jay Samet. And, you know, he even said to me before, he said, I'm not selling anything. You can cut down my bio, but this is a really impressive bio. International best-selling author Jay Samet is a dynamic entrepreneur and intrapreneur who is widely recognized as one of the world's leading experts on disruption and innovation. Described by Wide Magazine as having the coolest job in the industry, he raises hundreds of millions of dollars for startups, advises Fortune 500 firms, transforms entire industries, revamps government institutions, and for three decades continues to be at the forefront of global trends. The former independent vice chairman of Deloitte Consulting, Samad helped grow pre-IPO companies such as LinkedIn, been a NASDAQ company CEO, and held senior management roles at EMI, Sony, 
and Universal Studios. Called the guru for the entire industry by Variety, his list of partners and associates reads like a who's who list of innovators, including Bill Gates, President Bill Clinton, Pope John Paul II, Steven Spielberg, Steve Jobs, Reid Hoffman, David Geffen, Sir Richard Branson, and Paul Allen. Samet's previous book, Disrupt You, Master Personal Transformation, Seize Opportunity, and Thrive in the Era of Endless Innovation, is currently published in 12 languages, including Urdu, I think that's pronounced Urdu, Icelandic, I can't even pronounce it, Icelandic, and Polish. Please join me in welcoming Jay Samet. But first, watch this. This is a story of two very different people. The first is Jay Samet, a globally successful CEO who has held major positions at record labels and Fortune 500 companies. Through over 40 years in the business world, he's worked with the likes of Steve Jobs, LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman, Bill Gates, and many more. Unlike most in the guru space, Jay has actually done it. His first book, Disrupt You, was an international bestseller translated into 13 languages. For his new book, Jay wanted to prove without doubt that anyone could become future-proof and make a million dollars. Enter person number two. This is Vin Clancy, a British guy who looked like this and who had just moved to America hoping to make it as an entrepreneur with no contacts, clients, or clues about how to be successful. You'll learn how Jay used the principles in this book to help Vin make a million dollars in his first year in America. If you want to do the same, the book is available now on Amazon with a full word written by Tom Bilyeu. Future-proof yourself by getting this book. Welcome to the show, Jay. Thanks for having me. All right, so I'm trying to think where to start, and I think the place to start is actually not to talk about anything that I just said in my monologue, uh, or even to talk about what we just saw in the video, but let's just find out a couple of fun facts about you. Um, okay. And, and look, the fun facts, I think, are connected to your credentials because we always talk about the importance of walking the talk. Well, you started your first company with just $1. Um, yes. Now, I guess your face was on the dollar and it was a giant <laughs> dollar on the screen. Um, but, but talk a little bit about the story. Talk about your story. You started your first company with a dollar. What did you yeah. spend it on? Don't uh, tell me what's paid I got 100 business cards. So um, when Star Wars came out, I, it just changed my life. I go, oh my God, that's what I want to do. I want to make Hollywood special effects. Um, I knew nobody in Hollywood. I knew nothing about special effects, uh, minor problems. Uh, so I realized back then you could go and hire Lucas and ILM if you had a giant budget, but I'm sure there's other people who like to have special effects that couldn't afford that. And I also knew that at 21 years old, no one's going to hire a 21-year-old running a startup to make their feature film. So what I did was I made the name of my company was Jasmine. My name's Jay Allen Salmon, and it was mine. Um, but I didn't make myself head of the company. I just gave myself a sales title. So now I could go out and hustle work. And when I got work on smaller pictures, then what do you do? You hire the people that know how to do it. You only need two things to be successful as an entrepreneur: insight. And perseverance everything else can be hired so you actually took the dollar and you spent it on on business cards i mean it, yeah. was, it was a a hard cost where obviously the beginning of networking but you talk about insight and perseverance right, right. let's talk about insight for a second so insight is what insight is vision is there are those it, who see things that are and ask you know, why? And then there are those who see things that could be and ask why not? No, it's, it's, it's really, our world gives us lots of data. If you seek it out, you'll find the answers to what you're looking for. Uh, so at that same time, I wanted to figure out how do I break into that business as a job, but I had no data. So I took out an ad just before the internet in the Hollywood Reporter, describing the job that I would like to have as if it was an ad from a film studio. It was called a blind ad. You don't know where you're flying. And that gave me two pieces of critical data. One, I got a bunch of resumes that came in, and I now knew what I would need on my resume and my experience to be able to get one of those jobs. And two, I now knew a whole bunch of companies where somebody had one foot out the door and they would have an opening soon. So you connect the dots. Give you the, the 21st century version of it, which I wrote about in, in Disrupt You. 
a young man wanted to get into advertising. He got the dream job. He got hired by one of the big multinationals. He's sitting in New York in a cubicle in a basement ready to shoot himself. This isn't the creative job that he thought. He's moving numbers around. And one day he notices on Google that the big famous creative directors, no one's bought their names as keywords. So for $9, so we adjust for inflation compared to my dollar, he bought the names of the five biggest creative directors. And whenever they Googled themselves, it would say, hey, I want to work for you. Click here to see my portfolio. Three of the five called him in and all three offered him jobs. He quintupled his salary for basically the price of a Vente Frappe Chino. I, I see another word uh, emerging um, from the uh, the magic the magic eight ball, um, and it maybe lives somewhere between the two of insight and perseverance. It's ingenuity. You know, it is it, it is the ability to. It's a hustle. Now that word has taken on a bit of a. Um, it's a loaded word. It's a terrible. But, but, but it's but, much easier. The hustle and, and and the ingenuity. That's all follow through. Okay, if you're. Most people have this belief that entrepreneurs sell things. They don't, they solve things. So if you solve a problem for five people, you have friends, solve for a million, become rich, solve for a billion, you change the world. So you have to say, what's a problem that isn't being solved? And every day somebody else has invented something that you could then take to solve your problem. The iPhone came out. Now suddenly tons of people created apps that solved little, little niches that became multi-billion dollar companies. So that's really what I'm talking about. So I have a, pr a process in Future Proofing You called the three problems a day for 30 days. Write down three problems in your life today. It's pretty easy to do. But if you do it every day for a month, somewhere around day two or day three, you tap out, you go, there's no more problems. Because we walk around with blinders of this is how it's always done, this is how it's always done. But if you look at the moment by moments, you realize the obstacles because obstacles are just opportunities in disguise. So I had a reader, I'll give you an example. I had a reader who was doing this exercise. And one morning, uh, he's taking his medicine, the phone rings, he finishes the call. And then he goes, wait a second, did I take my pill or didn't I? Ooh, that's a problem. If I take too many, I die. If I don't take it, I die. And then he thought about it and took a little Happy Meal watch, put on the lid of the bottle. When it closed, it says, oh, I opened it eight hours ago, or oh, I opened it three minutes ago. Then he added Bluetooth. And then they're sold everywhere around the world. You know whether grandma remembered to take her medicine. It's those, it's those brief insights that are the path. This idea, I mean, and we'll talk about these, um, these truths, right, for success, but leveraging obstacles for success. I mean, you dived into it, so I just want to follow up with it right now. Um, one was this ability, I, I guess the analogy is, there's a giant rock in the river and the water does not try and, you know, beat down the rock or refuse to, to, you know, to move forward. The water just goes right around the rock. And over time, days, weeks, months, years, decades, the rock is reduced to nothing but sand. And, and that, that's one way I think of the obstacle, which is sometimes it may seem insur like insurmountable but see, I take it the opposite. That rock is not moving. And unless you want to wait, you know, 2000 millennia, you know, to turn it into sand, how do you make the rock the opportunity? Right? People, people fly all the way to Ireland just to kiss a rock because somebody marketed it as the Blarney Stone. Right? So how do you take that obstacle and turn it into a positive? That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, I love that. I love that. And that, you know, it brings me back to David Rendell, who's on the show, um, who basically said, your weakness is, you know, don't turn the weakness into a strength. The weakness is the strength. Oh, absolutely. So if you believe that we're all different, your only competitive advantage is what makes you different. So every one of us has a superpower, one of the 12 truths. Lean into it. Mine, I'm dyslexic. As a kid, that meant I was told I was stupid, but it also meant as a kid that I don't want to be embarrassed. So when there was a group project, I would raise my hand first, let me be in charge. You do the reading part, you do the writing part. I learned how to delegate. What a great training for entrepreneurs. And one out of three Fortune 500 CEOs is dyslexic. Richard Branson dyslexic, Walt Disney dyslexic. It turns out it's a superpower. In future proofing you, 
There's a young man's story that I tell. Like many kids in middle school, he had ADD. And he didn't like the, the Ritalin drug just being in the cloud from everything. And he begged his parents, Mom, it, the only time I feel calm and can control my brain is in the pool in the backyard. If I promise to swim every day, can I get off the medicine? And the doctor said, sure, but you have to do it. And so he learned to control his mind in that pool. By the end of his teenage years, he had 17 Olympic medals, and you know him as Michael Phelps. His superpower wasn't swimming. His superpower was harnessing his ADD. I love that story. Um, and I had a feeling it was Michael Phelps. Um, but it it but it just shows you. So lean, it's not even leaning in, it's it's just embracing. Um, and, and we said, look, we said this before, you and I were chatting before the show went live. Um, and you basically gave me and and now everyone watching uh a very simple piece of advice, which is be the best in the world at what you do or be and the therefore, only, or you be the only, only person to do that. And so when Vin came and therefore to me, the best, right? Right. And I've spent my whole life doing that. And here's the reason. Yes, it looks like I'm super successful in all those things, but I hate competition. I hate it because I know on any day there's somebody smarter, better connected, better funded, better looking, just plain old better. I hate that dude. But if I'm the only guy doing it out there, I have no competition in the beginning, and then how long can I fight to defend it? At one point, I had seven of the 10 best-selling video games in the US. When the big guys jumped in with billions of dollars, time to get into the next business, right? Um, but Vin came to me with this idea of he wanted, he grew up as most millennials with social media, he wanted to do social media for other people. Like probably 40 million other people out there, and like when you're basically, you know, nobody out there with no money you're not going to get like coca-cola and and you know you know gm to hire you but i said okay if that's what you want to do but why don't you look at what people are talking about what's in the zeitgeist of the moment and be the guy who does social media just for that one thing because the second you get your first client even if it's for free you then have what they call at harvard business school a case study look what i did for this person and now you have that entire industry so that's exactly what he did. And so what a client was paying $200 a week for him to do in the first month, other clients were paying for the same identical service, 30,000 a month by month three. So tell me a little bit more about, about this story because, you know, and, and then we'll get back to the actual concept of future proofing. Sure. Um, and maybe even the, even the soliloquy, which is. Yeah, I want to attack the soliloquy, but. Um, yeah, attack it. That's great. Um, that, that's so, so let, 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 let's fill people into the story. So I wrote Disrupt You as a way to pay it forward. I, I had an a, a unusually blessed career, but I got to know all these famous people and work with them before they were famous household names and all of that. And I realized most of them aren't smarter than the average bear. They didn't come from the right families. They didn't go to the right schools. What did they do different? Why is there a self-made billionaire every 48 hours? What are they doing? How are they seeing the world? And can it be taught? So first I started teaching it at the university level. I had students do over $100 million in the semester. Um, and then I tried to scale it by doing the book and it took a life of its own that I couldn't imagine. And I've gotten letters from all over the world, emails of how it's changed people's lives. But occasionally I'd get an email that said, this is motivational, but I could never do it. And that aided me. And I said, how can I reach those people? So I came up with this experiment. Could I take somebody, in this case, an immigrant who was couch surfing, basically one step above homeless, grew up on welfare, could I mentor him one day a week, give him no capital, no contacts, not tell him what to do, and, and guide him, spoiler alert, self-made millionaire in 11 months. And then I took those mentoring sessions and, and consolidated it down to the 12 truths. So that was, that was the story. And... You know, I think it's it, it 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 brings it concretely of how you can achieve what you believe. I, I'm going to bring him onto the show uh, at some point, and and I think it would be really amazing to hear him tell his story from the other side. Um, oh, yes, because I'll tell you one thing. So six months into it, he handed me something that he wrote to himself after our first meeting. 
which basically, and I have, it's in, it's in the book, but it, in my words, it's basically this old guy's full of it. I could never do this, but I'll play along because I got nothing else going on. Right. So the first truth is you have to have a growth mindset. And there was no way with his background that he would organically have one. And I didn't have the time for him to organically build the self-confidence and, and know that he could achieve. So, and he didn't get to find this out till the book was done. And I sent it to him. Uh, I lied to him in our first meeting. Not proud of it, but there was a reason. There's a psychological effect called the Pygmalion effect. A professor went to school, tested all the kids, told the teachers, these three kids would be super achievers. They'd be super learners. End of the year, you take a test. And yes, those three kids outshined everybody else. The lie was the professor never looked at the test in the beginning, picked three names out of a hat. But if you tell people they're special and you treat them special, you get special results. So I told Vin, I interviewed over 100 people, and you're the only one with all of the characteristics to be a self-made millionaire. When in fact, the experiment's only fair if I only pick the very first person. You can't cherry pick a person. So that got him to believe by the end of his first month when he did $60,000, he could he could have flown to Europe without a plane. I mean, he 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 was future proof. So, which gets me to your soliloquy. You prefer a term future protecting, which I think is absolutely the worst term and impossible because future protecting means you're trying to defend something. I'm Kodak, I'm going to defend my business model. Kodak invented the digital camera and they thought by shelving it, they'd be able to sell film forever. You can't protect. The horse buggy, you can't protect, okay? Future proof isn't about defending your business. Future proof is about looking at the world as a dynamic place and using those skills. So Vin worked unbelievably hard for that year. No dating, no movies, no watching TV. Hustle, you know, clients all day, do the work at night. And by the end of the, the year, he was ready to burn out. But what kept him going is he knew he was going to take the next year off and travel the world. And the only way he could do that wasn't because he made enough money to live the rest of his life, but he knew whenever he wanted to start again, he was future-proof. He had the tools in any situation to thrive. So thank God you did that because, as I said to you in my soliloquy, I've, I've been uncomfortable with that whole conversation until today because... I would I would always talk about it. it was consistent with with what I preach what I practice which is the ability to be future proof but there was so much pushback and opposition to that and so I fell back reluctantly on this idea of future protecting but I want to I want to summarize what you said is you can't protect something that is doomed right I'm going to just reframe slightly yeah. how can you protect something that is basically you know, on its way out. It could be even the corporate era, which is consistent with built with built to suck. But I'll but put then, it the shortest way. The Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Somebody discovered bronze. It made a better weapon. The oil age, the fossil fuel era, isn't going to end because we run out of fossil fuels. Turns out solar is cheaper now and more abundant. So you can't suddenly put a genie back in a bottle when the world has a better way of doing something. That's the point. When, when I was brought in to turn around Sony, one example that just comes to my mind is Sony had the best assembly line in the world, the best manufacturing for making a big tube television set. And so they're like, we got a few more years out of this. We're not making the flat screens like Samsung. And I'm like, this is insane. You're not making what the customer wants because you've got all your money in tooling. Well, Sony was a hundred billion dollar company back then, and now it's like an eighteen billion dollar company. You can't protect. And some nations right now, the governments that I work with, those that have money and power want to stay that way, protect themselves. So what they do is they set up tax situations that they tax money that goes into startups before the startup gets it. So take your risk capital, make it even riskier to stop people from inventing because they believe that ideas don't cross borders. Insane. I'm going to basically just complete the sentence, which is future protecting is essentially a stay of execution. Um, Absolutely. So I will never use that term again 
In fact, and I'm going to say, and if you got a problem with that, you just go and uh, you you call up Jay. Jay will you got it. set you straight. But I'd like you to define future proofing because the the thing that I'm just okay. the, the piece of the puzzle that that I'm that I just want to be able to connect now is is how Ben became, as you say, future proofed. And the one thing that you know, the crumb that you've or the nugget that you've dropped is. Future proof equals, and I'm going to ask you to define it, but it seems like the definition of it is the ability to have the tools to be able to deal with whatever life throws your way, but more importantly, how to always be able to see the opportunity and see, right. you know, so so would you define that uh, for me, please? Sure. First, first, let me prove it, and then I'll define it. If you take the pandemic, I no longer have to tell people that whether by choice or circumstance, every career gets disrupted, right? Did that for five years. The pandemic proved that one. But let's look at disruption isn't about what happens to you. It's how you respond. For the bottom 140 million people in America, they're fighting over 1%. It's a miserable existence. It's just paying bills until you die. During the same pandemic, the 150 wealthiest Americans doubled their net worth. Not what they make in a year, they doubled their net worth. So what did they do differently? How did they approach this change differently? And that's what future proofing is. We live in a world of endless innovation, of endless change. As you said, the only constant change. But every change is an opportunity. Every obstacle is an opportunity in disguise. It's to look at the problems, if you have problems in your life, you're halfway to being successful. If you have no problems, there's no way for you to master something to change. You know, failing is part of the process, uh, you know. So that's what it's really about. The problem with many people or most people in, in the big corporate world is they believe what got them to the corner office, the C-suite, is what will get them through life is the right path. You know, I'm Jack Welsh. I did this after World War II. And now I run GE. Yeah, but that path won't work for somebody today. And it probably won't work for a company. Half of the products the companies make five years from now will not be the products they make today. Apple Computer was a failed computer company. It never got to double digit market penetration. So Steve said, what can I pivot? And suddenly he tries making a consumer electronic device, something little iPod. Wow, nobody went after him. Nokia had 45% market share of mobile phones. You know, everybody laughed at a phone that didn't have buttons on it, right? Where's Nokia now? So that ability to constantly, you know, eat your own and, and, and seek new pastures is the only way to be future-proof. I mean, I would add, I would add a couple of just little builds to that, which is um, with the iPhone uh, and with the iPod and the iPhone. The iPod. This is the story that I that I tell, that I've written about, and that I teach as well. Is that it didn't appear to be a threat or even competition to the Zune and 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 Sony's product because it was so dumb. It was so dumbed down. Stop, play, pause, rewind, fast forward. So it didn't appear to be a threat. And then in the in the Nokia example, um, it really, as it, I don't know whether the vision was there from the get-go. We can't ask Steve Jobs. Uh, uh, and even if he were alive, he wouldn't tell us, or maybe he would. Um, but the fact is the iPhone is not a phone. And it never, and, and it stopped being a phone a long time ago. It is, I mean, it, it speaks to what you would call the trillion dollar opportunity. It became an entire app ecosystem. So those would be my two builds. Um, so I, I, I'd agree with you with different words. What made the iPod win was not the device, but the ecosystem. iTunes is what won, right? right. And the second half of it, if you look at Walmart versus Amazon, they both had the same business model, and this most people miss, and I write about it on Future Proofing You. There were lots of retailers selling stuff before Walmart, but Walmart said all the big guys are in the big cities, so the people that lived in rural America would make that once a month trip to the big city to load up and buy the stuff they need. 
So Walmart put all their first stores in these towns you've never heard of in the middle of nowhere. So people didn't have to make a whole trip to get what they want and circle the mall and find a parking space and the whole bit. They made, they brought the products to where the customer lived. All that Amazon did was do the last mile. You no longer had to leave your house to get those things. They came right to you. So when you look at solving a problem, Walmart sold the same things as the other people at the same prices. Amazon didn't take over the world by being the low cost leader. If anything, they got busted early on that they saw their most frequent people. They actually charged more for items because they knew you weren't price comparison until somebody did and said, why are you penalizing your best customer? So it's really that approach of looking at a problem and doing it. And then the insight, the only competitive advantage you have in the 21st century is getting insights from your customers faster than the competition. So I'll give you a, a, my, my, my go-to example because it's such a great one. So for those young enough to not know that there was a way to date before swiping, there used to be online dating. And there were websites and they'd have a still picture and you read about the person, you email, la di da When broadband came out 10 years ago, three guys sat down and said, we're going to make a fortune. We're going to have the first dating site with videos. We can see the person, get a sense of it. It was called Tune In Hookup. Flawless business model, great engineers, great website, great interface. We're going to make money. Oh, my God. Here's the first video somebody put up to try to get a date. They're standing there in front of the elephant at the zoo explaining why you should go out with them. Yeah, real, real sex appeal. So they had a tragic flaw. People were using it, but it turns out no one wanted to date these losers. But they looked at the data, and the data told them something that wasn't in the business plan. Nobody wanted to date these people, but they sure as heck wanted to share these videos with their friends. So they changed the name of Tune and Hook Up to YouTube and became billionaires without a penny in revenue. I, I know that story and I love that story. And I was just smiling as you were telling it. Um, Jay, I want to I want to uh, build on just a different model. And then I want to talk okay. to what I think needs to be addressed, which is there are you know, there are, first of all, there are a lot of fly-by-nights. There are a lot of charlatans that are selling get-rich-quick schemes. It's happening. This is not a get-rich-quick scheme. No, no. And, and it's happening now, now, especially with, you know, with um, people so desperate. Um, and, you know, I actually had um, uh, Mark Schaefer uh, on the show. He's just written a book called Cumulative Advantage that talks about the Matthews, of, the Matthew effect, right? The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. One of the one of my hopes as well is to be able to take future proofing you and and I think that's kind of the spirit that you've brought this to and and be able to allow this message to resonate uh, with those 140 million uh, oh, yeah. people that are struggling. But I just so that's my, let me just touch that. That's my soapbox. Why am I doing this? You can only have democracy with a strong middle class. The middle class got eviscerated globally during the pandemic. When I saw what happened at our nation's capital in January, I'm not talking politics. What I saw were thousands of people feeling left out, left behind, fighting over leftovers. We were taught in school how to be factory workers, how to read enough and, and do a little bit of math. Those jobs are gone. Half of all jobs that we have right now will disappear in the next five years. So unless we teach people how to be future proof, it's going to look like a lot of third world countries really fast. Yeah, and so and so we'll you know we'll talk to some of them uh, as well in a moment. Here's the model I just wanted to bounce off you for a second. This is something that I that I hold and that I share as well. And I'm thinking now talking to you, you might have a different take on it. Um, and I really do love your perspective. So my model is a simple two by two matrix because. You know, I used to be a consultant as well. And as I often say, we get paid by the matrix. Um, that's a little bit of consultant humor for you, if you like. Um, but this is the model. It's two by two. You discard or reject the worst of the old, and you keep the best of the old. You embrace the best of the new, and you reject the worst of the new. Now, I'm just wondering how you feel about that and how you think about that in context of this idea of 
be the best in the world at what you do and or maybe and be the only person to do that? How does it reconcile? It sounds very consultant speak. Because let's said, take things the matrix. Let's take things and put them in boxes. It's not the way I teach people to look for opportunity. There are endless things that have been invented that other people have created, that other people have used, that were made for a purpose. And you can take that and apply it to some other problem and solve it. So the iPhone, as you said, wasn't just a phone, but people created apps to, you're, you want to get carpet in a room, you can now measure the room in two seconds, right, with your phone. I mean, you take blood pressure with it. You could use all these other uses. So it's really about matching a big problem, to use your consultant speak, your big total addressable market, with some solution that you don't have to create from scratch. That's the great thing about nowadays. It's all sitting out there. The one from, from school that we learned that was a complete lie is the Gutenberg printing press. The way it's taught in school is that he's like Doc Brown from Back to the Future. He's sitting on the can. Instead of the flux capacitor, it goes, I'm going to make movable type in a printing press. Complete lie. Here's what happened. 1,500 years before him, the Greeks liked olive oil, and they realized squeezing olives by hand gets you know carpal tunnel syndrome or whatever. They made a little olive press. It then took 1,500 years for somebody to say, you know what? Stomping on grapes is hard on the feet. We're going to make a bigger olive press. And all of a sudden, everybody was making Riesling wines because you didn't need a whole bunch of labor. So much so that they made more wine in Germany 500 years ago than they do today, and every vintner went bankrupt. Now there's all these presses that nobody needs sitting there, and he came up with another use for it. That's what I'm talking about. I'm trying to like connect all the dots and there's so many of these beautiful dots and there's a beautiful picture emerging as well. Um, there are no new ideas. Um, everything is a derivative of that which came before. Find new cases, new use cases, but create them from something that exists, which is exactly what you said, which is you yeah. don't need to recreate the wheel. You just need to repurpose it. Like one, one of my 12 truths is everything is high-tech startup. I don't care if you're if you're selling shoes, if you're if you're have a restaurant, whatever, you have to think of it from a high-tech standpoint. And and you can't get to this, well, I'm not an engineer. Well, Steve Jobs, who you mentioned, he wrote the same amount of code as you and I. Zero, zilch, created the first trillion dollar company. The most successful tech company, I would argue, of the past 10 years has had the highest stock growth, wasn't Facebook, wasn't Apple wasn't Amazon, one of the number one tech company from for the past 10 years. Domino's Pizza. When Domino's became app centric, they knew their customers' taste, they could test market, they could be responsive, they could reduce stuff. The majority of the employees of Domino's Corporation are in IT. That's what I'm talking about. Making the pizza part is the actually easiest part of the business. It's everything else that goes around it. And I can tell you this from the Deloitte experience. It's not just auto self-driving trucks get rid of truck drivers and robots get rid of factory workers. You're not going to need lawyers for most things. It's going to be software. You're not going to need middle management. You're not going to need accountants. Okay. So white collar jobs are going away too. So unless people start realizing what they learned in school will not get them through life, what got them to where they are will not get them to stay there. Forget moving forward. That's what I'm trying to, you know, shake into people for the selfish reason. I mean, there's never been a war between two countries that have a McDonald's. Pause and think about that for a second. What it's really saying is countries that have a middle class don't really war with each other. You know, Europe came out of centuries of every, you know, 50 miles, you know, fighting with each other because a middle class emerged. So I don't want to see that disappear right now. Mm. And when you think of all the stuff that is coming out and available, you just have to do one thing. There were two guys sitting in traffic in Tel Aviv. Every city has traffic. 
it's got bad traffic. I live in Los Angeles. We got them beat. But they just sat there and said, wait a second. The phone company knows where my phone is. It knows where the other guy's phone is. If it tells me to go left and them to go right, there's no more traffic. That was the genesis of Waze. It's just those insights to solve a basic problem. Not these, if you want to solve, I mean, I didn't want to run another company, but I had to say yes to be chairman of a company that figured out how to solve global warming and poisons in the food and a couple other things with one product that I go, this has to be successful. I'm morally obligated to roll up my sleeves and go back in the fight again. Did, did you like, by the way, how, as you were saying the story of ways, I was able to quickly put that onto the screen. Um, you're, 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 you're a master producer. I'm starting, I'm starting to learn how you think, which, which is starting to scare me as well. Um, we got some, um, based on everything you just said, Stephen Rubin said, brilliant. David Libby said, got it, incredible. Uh, Tom says, when you know the history of the printing press, it explains why we read books while eating olives and drinking wine. Um, <laughs> I'm stealing that line, Tom. Oh, it, it, this happens a lot on the show. And he also said, in a time when we're rightly talking about purpose, it's often repurposing that is the magic. That is a that is a great soundbite. It actually also makes me think of, uh, I always find a quote uh, of the episode connected to my guest, just like my background, just like the soliloquy, uh, and this is yours, Jay. Uh, the future awards the humility of learned alls and punishes the hubris of know it alls. Um, I thought you would like that. And yeah. uh, there wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of quotes uh, on future proofing, which is kind of ironic if you think about it. Um, but this one actually comes from maybe the only other person that seems to have written anything uh, on it. And uh, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've heard of this author. Uh, Molik Perak, um, who wrote a book on future proofing. Um, but it seems like future proofing is both a mindset of continuous learning, continuous improvement, continuous motion, and a suite of tools designed to help you course correct or at least triangulate direction, momentum, velocity, Etc. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah. I mean, the first acceptance is that everybody else that's having these great lives isn't smarter than you. So I looked up the late the latest studies, okay? Uh, Four-year college graduates don't end up wealthier than those that didn't go. People with higher IQs don't end up wealthier, okay? So, and most of the wealth in the world is not her heredity. They didn't come from a great family and, you know, you're not sitting there like royalty, which means that whatever these people are doing can be taught. They learned how to look at the world differently than the way that was forced in us in school. Most of us have a voice in our head that says that we can't do this, you know, can't do that, we're not good enough. And that's why I wrote Disrupt You. Everybody thinks of changing the world, but nobody thinks of changing themselves. So the second you can change that voice, and the reason why parents and teachers and well-wishers try to limit you as they were trying to protect you from failing and protect you from pain. No such thing. All growth comes from failing. When you fail, you don't end up where you start. You either earn or you learn, but you will fail your way forward. That's how a child learns to walk. That's how you make it through a video game. You know, it's not like your, your water obstacle. It's like you sit down, you, you hit that obstacle, and you hammer it, then you finally figure out how to get that one, only to find out, guess what? There's another obstacle, another. And that's what a career is, that's what a company is. But if you can take the, that, that pride out of it, when you realize in a world this dynamic, you can't do it alone. You know, future, uh, the tw uh, truth number eight, don't fly solo, you're gonna need a series of mentors. And I teach people how to get mentors. You don't just out of the blue send an email, hey, will you be my mentor? That's like going into a bar and going, hey, we have my baby. But if I can show you on LinkedIn how to find the people that are open to it, how to start a dialogue, you could have a lifelong mentor without ever using the M word. And you can't make it on your own. That, that self-made myth is mythology. Beautifully stated. Now I want to go back to that conversation because people are, are vulnerable at the moment. People are desperate at the moment. 
the reason why I read your entire credentials because and uh, and talking so much about what you've done is there's no question about where you've come from your 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 motives your motivation um but as i was saying there are a lot of fly by nights there's a lot of courseware there are a lot of masterminds there are a lot of life coaches out there you said to me before we began that there are ways to spot them and uh, and there are certain uh, behaviors and, and i would love for you to share some of those for people that maybe are a little bit susceptible to uh, misdirection right now have you ever seen a famous chef that's anorexic no oh. right so you know if if you've got if you got the keys to the kingdom are you did you make that by achieving things again and again or did you make it by selling key rings to the kingdom. Uh, one of the things that really that I had to set straight and why I started writing these books is I've, I've lived it. I've sat in the empty room, you know, turned things into billion dollar companies. I've taken over failed companies that had one month of, of payroll left and 18 months later sold it for $200 million. I've been on all sides of it. I'm not smarter than the average bear. I've made more mistakes than anybody, but I've learned the patterns. One of the things that these gurus say that like, makes my hair stand on end is when they go fear isn't real get over your fears you know the, a lot of them have acronyms f-e-r whatever you know nothing could be further than the truth and this sets person to feel like they're not as good as everybody else fear is real as can be matter of fact the only reason you're alive is because your great great grandfather who lived in the cave when that saber-toothed tiger came he ran the guy who didn't doesn't have any descendants, okay? So our lizard brain, the central core of our existence has a fight or flight. So every opportunity, the second you walk in to do a meeting, to do a sale, subconsciously, the first thing a person's doing is this person going to attack me. Says, you know, there's natural fear. So you have a fear of being embarrassed. You have a fear of failing, a fear of losing your money, a fear of losing other people's money, legitimate fears. But I ask you, Joseph, if you're walking down the street obsessing about these fears, and a bus has no brakes and is barreling towards you. What goes through your mind? Get out of front of the bus. It'll kill you. An existential fear. So you can prioritize fear. Fear of dying, fear of your life being over is the ultimate fear. So if you're in a job that doesn't pay you enough that to live the way you want to do, that you're, they pay you enough to show up and not enough to care, your life is just a series of, 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 of struggling. You're trading a day of your life, a week of your life, a year of your life. You're going to wake up one day and you've given up the only most precious life you'll ever have for what? The purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. So if you can keep that fear front and center, those other fears of who cares if people make fun of you? Well, you've actually, Every, you've actually said it's, it's point number three, right? Harness fear to your advantage. Don't so now let's get to the harness part. Embrace it. So now that if you can believe that, and I go through the three primary fears, now turn the table. You're not the only one with those. That person sitting across the table, they have the same fears. So I remember going into very young, I got a meeting with the CEO of Pepsi. This was going to change the course of my company. Oh my God, I, I studied, I knew everything. I came in prepared. This was the most important meeting ever up until that point in my life. But for the CEO of Pepsi, this was the only thing stopping him from going to lunch. Kind of an imbalance. No rational arguments going to engage him. But I thanked him for letting me have the meeting and making this date because tomorrow I'm in Atlanta. Ding! Coca-Cola headquarters. Ding, my competition. Wait a second. <laughs> if Coke use, uses this and they find out at the board that I didn't, I could lose my job. I could be embarrassed. So let me find out what this kid's got to say. Get what I'm saying? And, and I tell the story in, in Future Proofing You of how I noticed two presidential elections ago, which seems amazing nowadays, not a single candidate was spending any money on social media. And like they're spending $2 billion. I had a digital agency at the time. I want some of that money. But the guys running campaigns were, you know, been running campaigns the same way, TV, radio, billboards for a century, wasn't going to convince them on rational thought. But I told him I had meetings with all the other candidates. 
And now they said, wait a second. Well, if the other candidate wins because he did this, I'll never get hired again. Make a long story short, I ended up with the Obama and his three Republican competitors, all as clients. Fear works. Machiavelli came up with the idea. I'm not going to take credit for it. Is it better to be loved or feared? Better be loved, but you can't control love. You can't control fear. And I'm not talking mafia fear. Buy this thing or I'm going to beat you up. But understand what goes on in people's minds and harness that. So just very quickly, and then uh, I want to ask you the question of the week. You're actually using fear in context of recognizing, instead of debilitating fear that destroys you, recognize that you're no better or worse off and everyone else has that fear. And it's it's less about it's less about controlling your own fear. And it's in a way more about taking advantage. I don't know what I don't want to say take advantage of, but playing into that other fear. So it's less about exploiting the other fear. And I think more about representing that we all have it. And therefore, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, maybe is the best way to to frame that. You can't make it go away. So you have to deal with it is what I'm saying. And the other people can as well. Athletes learned this a long time ago. They harness fear to get adrenaline going and pumping. And that allows them to do more than they would do if they didn't have that going through. You want to have cortisol going through your brain. There's a lot of things that you can do that affect your physiology and biology to allow you to be more successful. Jay, you are, uh, you, you know, what I've loved most about this conversation is it's been, um, mental and intellectual uh, sparring, but this to me feels like uh, the kind of meal that would not leave me looking like an anorexic chef is the best way to describe it. Um, and I've loved the sparring and how we've been able to get to a better place. Everyone watching as well, Bob says, another episode I'll have to watch again. David said, I was thinking that too. And Manif says, Future proofing sounds like a proper treatment for anxiety as well. I'm buying. I think what they really are saying is that it, like future protecting is defending something that cannot be defended. But future proofing is not about defense. It's about offense. It's about evolution, but it's about offense and moving forward. And, and just to add, because we're talking about, again, I don't sell anything on my website that's been made clear. To get the most out of either of my books, I have workbooks. Because a lot of times you're just going, oh, this makes sense, this makes sense. You get to the next chapter and what you just learned goes out your ear. If you go to the, the URL that's there, you can download either of the workbooks. They're completely free. And that'll allow you to, to really start making a, a plan for your life. And that's all I'm trying to do is pay it forward and ease your journey to success. I have the, I have the scars. Maybe you don't have to have as many. So. Thank you for that. And I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. Uh, as have I. You can download the free workbooks at jsamet.com. Uh, and if you want to find out more and uh, and and stay connected to Jay, um, you can do that via Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. You know the usuals. Um, and of course, the book is called Future Proofing You, 12 Truths for Creating Opportunity, Maximizing Wealth and controlling your destiny in an uncertain world. Jay, one more question, the question of the week. Uh, what is the single thing in your professional life that you're most proud of? Disrupt you, and, and I'll tell you why. I didn't anticipate the impact it would have on my life and the life of others. I, I thought about it almost in a, in a 20th century mindset of, here's a bunch of information I'm putting out in the world and I help it goes to use. I didn't expect hearing from so many people. I didn't expect the people that em embraced it. And I had one, one teacher who said, you know, I, I, I teach in an inner city. The kids have a choice between, would you like fries with this or going to jail? Can I turn this into a high school course? She won teacher of the year. And then I leaned on HP and made them print copies for all the boys and girls clubs. I mean, it's just taken on a life. And, and if you want to have joy in life, it comes from helping others. That's all that any of this is about. And so that's brought me the most joy of anything I've ever done. That's wonderful to hear. You know, we always end the show with um, the decision as to whether you were hit or not. 
So let's hear what Chuck Norris has to say. You are Chuck Norris approved. I mean, there's an absolute shocker. Please join us now in the Zoom after show to interact a little bit with Jay, myself, and our wonderful regulars. You'll get to meet a lot of the people that you were seeing uh, commenting. Uh, Jay, it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in just a few minutes. Talk to you in a couple. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.